Hello and welcome to Doing Business in Rwanda. My name is Michael Mjisha. On this particular episode, we have a one-on-one -on -one exclusive sit down with RDB CEO Clara Kamanzi as we touch base with the contribution that the special economic zones have had to Rwanda's economy. Of course, we still understand that the country registered about $2.006 billion just ahead of the uh, two billion dollar target in 2018 and of course a lot of that goes on the back of the always working Rwanda development board now she joins us now to touch base with all of this on today's edition of doing business in Rwanda Claire, thank you very much for getting time to speak to us. Thank you for having me over. It's uh, very interesting that we catch you in office and then uh, go over some of the things that happened in 2018, but also way before that. We understand that uh, the country registered about $463.18 million off of uh, uh, exports in 2018, first half of uh, 2018, a big number there. But uh, we understand that most of it was coming from uh, agriculture exports. As the special economic zone, what kind of contribution are we looking at? And of course, I don't just want the numbers for 2018, but just give me a good look at at least a few of the years that it's been there. Mm -hmm. How has the contribution from this particular uh, project paid off? Well, uh, first of all, the, the, the advantage of having the special economic zone is that it allows us to process what we have in the country and sell them because what we're looking at the special economic zone is really industries, right. yeah? So manufacturing, processing, among others. Central to that is agro-processing. Uh, you know, historically, Rwanda has been uh, exporting commodities, whether it's tea or coffee or other products, mostly in the raw form. But what, what we're beginning to see is that that's changing. Uh, if you look at agriculture exports that happened even in 2018, a big part of that was um, what our agro-processed companies are doing. Let me give examples. So African proved foods, um, who make nutritious foods using soya, milk, uh, uh, maize, among other, other inputs. They're buying f you know, from farmers products such as maize, and they're also using milk to actually make the formulas that they do. They're exporting right from the special economic zone. And last year, they exported about $30 million uh, worth of produce just from what they make in the country. So that processing, the infrastructure in the special economic zone enables us to attract investments such as African proof foods who actually make a very big contribution in the exports that we make. Another example I want to give is Azam. They're in the special economic zone. They, they make flour, processed flour. You know, they also go into beverages uh, and, and they're also beginning to export within the region. So. Industrial parks actually provide the infrastructure to make it faster for industries to take off. And when industries take off, they allow a country such as Rwanda to export beyond commodities, really processed products that actually make a very big difference because we get more money from processed products than we get from commodities. Talk to me about incentives. Of course, uh, we've also uh, touched base with some of the investors who are currently set up in the special economic zone. And one of the things that they've been uh, talking about back and forth is that they commend the efforts of course with changing the investor code and uh, that is I think up to two years mm -hmm. but now looking at why can't this be done annually and they say there are countries that are doing that annually and it's bear it's bearing fruits mm -hmm. is RDB or the government of Rwanda looking at this particular issue having investors every other year coming back to look at the investor code and also some of the inf incentives that could be changed to see how uh, business can be done smoothly? Well, incentives are very important uh, for many investors, but they need to be predictable, mm. both by the investor but also the government. Because if you look at incentives, especially if you're talking about tax incentives, they need to be predictable on the government side because government needs to know what they expect to collect as taxes, because taxes are the main source of financing government business, right? On the other hand, the investor also needs to be predictable to know if I'm co coming to do business and I, have, I do a business plan of five years or of 10 years, or if I have a 25-year concession, I need to know what to expect in terms of 
uh, the financials, including the tax incentives. Mm -hmm. And so you can't keep changing it every year because then you lose that predictability. You lose the pred predictability for government to know what to expect in terms of tax collection, but you also lose predictability on the part of the investor because the business plan changes every year. So I don't believe that it's a good idea for the, an investment code to be changed many times because it loses that predictability. However, when it comes to um, new ways of thinking, a government should constantly be receiving feedback from investors on what needs to change and how it needs to change. And um, that could be one of them, but it doesn't always mean that you have to go back and change the laws all the time. Mm -hmm. I think it takes time to really uh, understand what the challenges are. And if it's a new um, issue that you didn't think about, be flexible to change it. We changed our investment code in 2015. Right. This is 2019. In between, uh, there's some regulations, there's, some, there's room for ministerial orders to change, not, not the law necessarily. So yes, be open uh, to getting feedback and ideas, but you don't want to do that so often that investors lose track of what's happening in the country. But I also want to emphasize that incentives are not just tax related. There are other sorts of incentives that are policy related or program related. For those, you can change every year, as long as you're making it better every year. And that's what we do with the Doing Business Report. We have action plans every year to change and improve our environment. And it doesn't matter that you do that every year. It, it, it's not one of those that need that predictability. Because if you're improving how business is done every year, everyone is happy. No one will complain about that. Why don't you give us a sneak peek into what we should expect for 2019? Of course, we've seen Rwanda ranking 29th on the Doing Business Report by World Bank, of course, largely on some of the reforms that we saw through the year, and of course, access to credit being one of them growing uh, largely. But what should we expect moving forward in terms of investment? Who are we expecting to come? Just give me something like that. <laughs> well, first of all, in terms of what to expect, uh, expect improvement. Because in Rwanda, uh, what we've agreed uh, to is that every year there will be an improvement in our doing business environment. So expect improvement. Now, where is the improvement going to come from? Our approach in uh, the doing business ranking is how do we preserve the areas we're doing, doing well? And even if Rwanda is the second uh, and the third in registering property and getting credit in the world, for us to maintain those positions, we have to have new reforms. So we're improving even in those areas. Uh, improving the automation around transfer of property. We have, we have new ideas on how to improve uh, modernization and automation, bringing more services online. Um, but apart from improving what we're doing well, we're spending even more time on the areas that we don't do well to see how we improve that. And top of our list is construction permits. Um, how do we reduce the time it takes to get a construction permit? How do we reduce the number of steps that an applicant has to go through to get a construction permit. How do we reduce the cost of getting a construction permit? Because right now, uh, the costs are quite high. Uh, if you look at the studies that you're asked for, if you look at uh, you know, environmental impact studies, geotechnical studies, among other requirements that you have to put in place, they co they're costly. So how do you significantly bring down the cost of getting a construction permit? I think you'll see real, real results this year, because we're focusing on that very much. Um, just like we're focusing on the other areas we're not doing well, like um, uh, trading across borders, uh, resolving insolvency, even starting a business, we want to see some improvement there as well. So I think around those angles is where you'll see improvement in 2019. All right, that's interesting. But maybe before I let you go, some of the other things that we wanted to touch base with, of course, it's one of the biggest objective of the Special Economic Zone. And you touched a little bit onto it in the beginning, but I want us to get a rather, you know, in-depth conversation. 6.8 to 7 million jobs are created globally through uh, Special Economic Zones. And uh, of course, China and uh, some of the countries that have been there leading the pack. And I'm not saying that Rwanda is not doing fairly well, doing great. You spoke about some thousands of uh, jobs that are being created. But if we're looking at uh, the Rwanda's target, uh, seven year target, to reach about 1.5 million jobs before 2024, how do the special economic zones chip in mm -hmm. to actually make this a reality? Mm -hmm. Well, um Yes, Rwanda has been creating new jobs every year. I think in RDB last year we did uh, mention that we, we produce more than 23,000 jobs from the investments that we attracted, but they're not enough. Like you said, uh, the target is 1.5 million jobs over seven years. What is the strategy of getting a high number of jobs uh, for our economy? 
the first one is really industrialization. Because uh, if you look at the number of people that are employed in agriculture, almost 70% of the population, this is a young productive population that can easily be absorbed in basic manufacturing without even requiring them to, to do a degree of four years or five years or go to school for 15 years. It's a convertible skill uh, for especially low, low, low skilled manufacturing. A very good example is garments, making of clothing. It's a very labor intensive job. We did a trial with um, CNH and at its peak, CNH was employing 1,500 people, just one company. And um, uh, these are basic skills that teach you how to you know, sew and how to put a cloth together. And uh, that's something that we, if we did 10 or 100 CNH type, type of businesses, and these are industries that happen uh, to be in the industrial zone or that are attracted by an existence of industrial zones, that is a very good strategy. So we're looking at those kinds of examples of industries that can help us create those kinds of jobs. And industrial parks very much contribute to that. I think an example of a country like Ethiopia. Ethiopia has industrial parks that are, have several companies that are making clothing and employing thousands of people. It's the same strategy that we have in Rwanda. And I think um, special economic zones are the primary source of the jobs we're talking about going forward. Claire, uh, I would like to thank you for creating time to speak to us. Mm -hmm. There is so much that we can touch, of course, in a limited hour conversation, but uh, we will be moving forward with all of that. Thank you very much for having me in your program. Allow us to leave you right there for this edition of Doing Business in Rwanda. You had it for yourself. First-hand experience, uh, Claire Kamanzi, CEO of Rwanda Development Board, speaking about how the contribution for the past 10 years uh, in the spatial economic zone has been for this uh, rather nascent economy uh, in Rwanda and uh, still looking at more foreign direct investment coming into the country. Allow us to leave you right here. If you have any feedback, be sure to send us a tweet to DBI Rwanda or send us an email directly at DBIR bn360.com or my personal handle on Twitter at Galwera4 for, uh, from the entire team here at CNBC Africa. It's bye for now.